Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast presented by Applied Software. You're invited to join our MEP and construction innovation adventure with the mission to propel this great industry forward. My guest today is Eric Hubri. He is fascinated by technology and how it continues to make businesses more successful and finds himself diving deeper into the applications of smart design, data analysis, and application development with each new endeavor. Currently, he runs the technology and innovation department for Arco Murray, a design build construction company and co-leads a small investment fund. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah. Let's start with how you got into the construction industry to begin with. Sure. Um, I'll try to keep this brief. The, the, the interesting part of the story was that I got into the construction industry uh, from a haircut with a friend. Um, my, <laughs> nice. That's, a, that's the first yeah. time I've heard that intro. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So I, I, had a, I was working in uh, advertising and marketing technology for the, the first part of my career, the first decade uh-huh. uh, of my professional life. And um, after a few conversations with uh, my friend, John, who worked at Arco Murray uh, and still works at Arco Murray, he's one of the partners, uh, he, they were trying to hire smarter on the technology side of their business. And he asked me to start reviewing some of the job descriptions that they were putting out to see if they could tweak it and improve it to attract uh, better talent. And after a few rounds of that, I saw one that said, if you changed a few things about this, I think I might actually want to talk to you about it. Yeah. Uh, so he did, and then introduced me to Joe Pomeranke, who is my business partner on all things technology and innovation. Uh, so I, I had breakfast with Joe, and 45 minutes later, I called my wife and said, I think I need to go work at this construction company, uh, which was very confusing for her, uh, granted that I was working in ad tech. Uh, so it was, it was quite a leap uh, at that point in my life and my career. That was about three and a half years ago, and uh, I, I have not regretted a moment since. It's been quite a ride and uh, quite an industry to be involved in. Yeah, that's awesome. What do you think was the, the biggest learning curve you had to adjust to? Uh, how a construction company works, I think. Um, how we make money, what, uh, what parts of the business uh, are working well versus what's not working well and and how technology kind of folds into all of that. Uh, I think the hardest thing has been focusing priorities on the highest value opportunities. Uh, and, and that has taken, you know, the first couple of years was really just understanding how we choose to operate as a design build construction business uh, and, and to where, where we compete and do very well and areas where there are opportunities for improvement that can really move the needle for us and be a differentiator. Um, that that took it took three years until I really felt like I was I was in a position to lead that strategy, as opposed to learning from my peers and and really helping to support the strategy that was in place. Um, and and I think I think we've gotten to the point now where where that's that's kind of turned on its head, and I'm I'm able to inform our business more more than I was before. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, kind of the, the converse to that, are there any um, kind of unexpected similarities coming into construction? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's all about data, right? And, and the ad tech world uh, yeah. did this, started this process 15 years ago. Sure. So there were a lot of problems that the business was facing that I saw and had an answer to uh, just in how data was managed, manipulated, organized, uh, transformed, stored. There was a lot there uh, that I was able to bring to the table pretty quickly uh, that helped us to answer a few questions. And, and just in terms of evaluating software to use, that again was something that I was both building and buying for the first decade of my career. So a lot of those things that they were struggling to understand and make decisions on were second nature for me. So, so there was some things I was able to contribute early on uh, beyond just, you know, learning what it is we're doing as a business and, and as an industry. Yeah, no, I think it's, there's so much value in getting kind of fresh eyes on it, on this problem in construction of the, how do you really use and uh, incorporate all this vast amount of data into a workflow and make it actionable instead of just having data for the sake of data, how do you make it work for you then? Um, and so I think bringing in outsider perspective is that's awesome. 
Yeah, and and I think that was um, that was a welcome experience for everyone, which I think made made the difference at Arco. If I had come in and there had been resistance to that outside perspective, we wouldn't have had as much success as we've had over the last three years. But the fact that we were coming in to collaborate together and that attitude was felt all around uh, made it a really exceptional experience. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we're coming to the, the end of 2021. Hard to believe that there's only one month left of the year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what do you think the, the state of innovation really is right now in construction? Well, I think we are on the takeoff ramp. Um, if I've learned anything from the last three years is that there's a lot of opportunity in, to, to shorten the phrase, architecture, engineering, and construction technology. The mm -hmm. AEC technology world uh, is, is rife with opportunity for innovation. And I think what we've seen in the, I mean, I'll, I'll say the same things that everybody else is saying, the, the reduction in cost to store data, the, um, the proliferation of mobile devices on job sites and the, the uh, kind of shift in demographic of people on job sites that are more, um, more open to technology being a part of their day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. uh, all of that has, has become more prevalent in the last three to five years. And that coupled with a, a lot of people paying more attention to our industry and a lot more people paying attention to venture capital as an investment vehicle or mm -hmm. investment into software companies as a, an opportunity to diversify a portfolio as being a real opportunity for more than just the, the people in the Bay Area of California that, that have been kind of pioneering this, this form of investment and, and execution of technology, uh, that, that has also proliferated. So we're reaching this, this confluence of both of these things existing at the same time, giving massive opportunity to those that are willing to take, I would say, a calculated risk to really jump into the forefront of that and, and start, to, start to lead it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I think we're at the point now where there are plenty of early adopters and there are plenty of people on the startup and founder side that are willing to entertain the idea of jumping into the AEC tech world. And it's just a matter of identifying the real opportunities versus the noise and, and betting on the right places and really just continuing to double and triple down on innovation as a differentiator to your business. Yeah. So how do you then weed out the noise then to, to find those opportunities? Cause there's, more yeah, <laughs> context yeah. startups spinning up <laughs> every day. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a great question, and I think, uh, I mean, on our investment uh, side of things, we have a scorecard that is that is evaluating a number of things, and the highest weighted thing is the people. Uh, I, and I think that's that's something that you'll hear from any venture capitalist or any investor in in startup companies. Uh, they will tell you. 10 times out of 10, that people are the most important thing. Mm. So I think the background of those people that are, that are involved uh, does make a difference. And I think what we've seen typically in the, in the successful uh, businesses that we've invested in and partnered with is a blend of experience from both technology and, and AEC, uh, where, where they can work together and, and identify challenges and opportunities on the technology side, but also have the experience and frankly, the empathy to understand what people are dealing with in the field and in the office on a day-to-day -day basis so that it doesn't feel like technology is intruding on your day or intruding on your job. It feels like someone is coming to the table to collaborate with you with technology as a tool that you can leverage to make your life easier and to make you more effective in your job or make you more productive or automate a system that is clearly not a value add. Um, I, I think, I think that's, that's where we've seen a, a major difference it is, is in those people that are willing to come to the table, willing to empathize, communicate, and educate above all else. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think that we necessarily have a technology problem. I, I think we have a communication, education, and empathy problem. Uh, and, and the more that we, we focus on those things and understand technology as the vessel or the tool to make our industry better in those areas, 
the more successful we'll be. And that's that's kind of where we're trying to focus in, in our investment and in our innovation strategy is, is who are the people that are really approaching it from that perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. So that kind of dovetails into how to really set up a, a successful implementation. What does that sure. kind of <laughs> ideal process look like for you? Yeah, well, I, I think identifying real pain is step one, right? Like finding things that need painkillers. Uh, and, and there's the, the common um, analogy used in venture capital is, are you a vitamin or are you a painkiller? Uh-huh. And we're really looking for those things that are solving pains quickly um, and being really opportunistic about that. So when we identify that, we try to partner with the operators in our business, speaking about this from the director of innovation perspective at Arco yeah. Murray. Um, we, we try to involve ourselves in as, as much of what the business is doing at an operating level. And then when we identify those opportunities, it's not something that our innovation team is coming to you with a solution. It's something that we are bringing the operator into the fold with the innovation team and empowering them to lead us to a solution. And that is a very different approach from what I've seen in the industry and what I've seen at Arco, frankly. Um, before I started, there was a lot of technology for the sake of technology being pushed to people. Mm-hmm. And there was much less of a collaborative effort of listening and learning and then presenting options and saying, does this, does this actually line up with what you're telling me? And that gives a, a little bit more of a, it gives a little more momentum and it gives a little more accountability and ownership uh, to the people that are experiencing the pain being presented with options and ch- helping to choose the solution mm-hmm. and being part of the driver of that solution. And I mean, the simple practical nature of that is get the operators, the ops leaders, the project managers, the accountants, whoever is experiencing the pain, put them in front of it and, and make them the owners of it. Uh, in, in collaboration with the, the subject matter experts that are on the innovation side um, and really follow their lead and, and, and hold them accountable and communicate the hell out of it so that everyone knows that this is something that is not just a, a shiny object from the, the, the innovation nerds, uh, yeah. but it's something that's really core to the business uh, that will make a difference. And it'll make a difference in this person's life that's telling you about it now. Right. Really unpacking the why behind what you're actually Absolutely. rolling out. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. So you mentioned it a little bit ago on the importance of communication, education, and empathy throughout this uh, implementation and kind of adoption process. Can you break that down a little bit more? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I, I think communication is the simplest of those three, right? Um, communicate, talk mm-hmm. to people, email, uh, create a cadence where people are expecting to hear from you so that they know when information is coming from the innovation team or whatever structure it looks like in in the organization that you're working in, there's a a schedule and an expectation that things are coming. So it's not something that you're kind of coming out of nowhere and and all of a sudden looking to gain attention and gain eyeballs. Um, To to put it very, very practically, my team has a spot on the agenda of every ops meeting in our business. And it might be five minutes to say nothing to report this, this month or this week, uh, but it's still there and it's felt as a part of the process so that the teams are not seeing it as an outside part of our work coming in. They're seeing it as a part of the everyday, an iterative process of improving our, our our processes and our workflows Mm -hmm. so that it's, it's a little less jarring when that communication comes through it just feels more natural. And the education side is actually quite difficult because a lot of the things we do may be simple by nature, but not by implementation. So a lot of our implementations efforts start with a heavy education component. Um, and, and really, if you want something to succeed, you want that education to be at the beginning of everyone's first day. <laughs> so that takes time to develop uh, content that can be plugged into whatever learning management system your organization is using or whatever onboarding processes your organization has. So it's not just an educational component when something is rolled out, but it's given that foundation so that as part of the business, if you're really serious about it, you're telling people about it when they come in the door. Mm-hmm. And that actually is, is a, a, 
a momentum builder and a momentum shifter, maybe more so than the initial rollout to existing users and associates, um, because there's a lot more work there on the combination of communication and education of kind of shifting their mentality and managing that change with a new person, they're a blank slate. And you can say, this is, this is the thing to do. And that's all they've ever known. So they just do it. Um, so for communication and education, those, those two are key. And, and that's kind of how we have approached them. And I think from the empathy side, I have learned more as the director of technology and innovation for Arco Murray, the construction company, sitting in job trailers with superintendents than anywhere else. Mm-hmm. And, and that is a, that's, a, that's a concerted effort for me to get to job sites and telling my team to get to job sites, talk to supers, talk to project assistants, talk to project managers, sit with them and see what they're doing and watch the, the mouse clicks that they're clicking, uh, you know, see how they're using Excel with their other systems, find those opportunities, not in just what's out there in the world, but in the experience of the people sitting in the seats in our business, um, whether it's someone that's swinging a hammer or, or sitting behind a screen all day, uh, there is, there's significant amounts to be learned from the ingenuity of our associates that are doing this work day in and day out with the tools they have currently and getting the job done. Mm. We're, we're really good at what we do. So we're not necessarily looking to, you know, put out a massive fire that's, that's raging in the center of the business. We're looking to identify the ingenuity of those people and get stuff out of the way that is not part of their, uh, their ingenuity and not part of their energy that's bringing value to the business. Um, so that, that part, I, I feel, I, I may feel most strongly about that because the communication and education doesn't really come through if the energy from understanding them and really feeling what they're feeling isn't behind those two things. Sure. Yeah. If I can try to boil it all down, I think it really needs to be infused in the culture and really in the, the DNA of the company for any one of those three to, to really take effect. It can't just be a, a programmatic thing. It has to be that DNA aspect of it that everybody has, has been bought into it and, and has all grown in the same direction. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and I think that there are, that is always on a spectrum, right? You can sure. work at a company that has that culture established and, and it's just a matter of, of addressing the entire spectrum and not just leaning into the, uh, the entrepreneurs that are like on the far end of the spectrum yeah. that are like, I'll try anything, like throw, throw me a new software and I'll plug it in and I'll, I'll see what I can do. Uh, it's really catering to everyone at every step of that, of that curve, of that adoption curve and making sure that you're being responsible and thoughtful about how you, how you communicate those things to, to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and to kind of go back to your communication point of it, having that regularly scheduled cadence where, where people can come to rely on that and expect that. I think that's huge too, that you have that consistency of, of going back and going back to the basics, even, even for the, the people that are on the, the far cutting edge, go back to the basics of this is why we're doing this. This is, yeah. you know, the, the value that we see in here. I think that that's important to kind of instill because yeah. people Absolutely. forget. <laughs> and, and it gives you an opportunity to, to communicate um, returns as well. Uh, sure. So a lot of times, I think it can be kind of left behind, you know, you, you sell, you sell an initiative and then you focus everything on implementation and there's a lot of opportunity to communicate progress along the way. And if you're doing it right, you have those measurable objectives uh, or measurable results uh, against those objectives that you can point to and say, you know, we now, now we have a uh, hundred ratings in our system, uh, in this initiative. And now we have 300 and now we have 700 and, and, and we can see that progress and continue communicating that success alongside the, uh, the new initiatives that the people are, are being asked to kind of jump into and adopt and, and try as a part of making improvements and iterating, they can see the tangible results through that communication of not just here's what's new and upcoming, but here's the progress you've made up to this point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So where's the responsibility lie kind of in, in the breakdown it, during the implementation phase between the tech provider and then the end user? That's a great question. And I think this is somewhat specific to our industry, 
but I do think that there is a greater onus on the uh, tech provider, uh-huh. uh, largely because of their end user. Um, construction companies are not set up to implement software. And if you want to successfully implement something and, and your, you, your self-interest is, is reliant on that adoption, mm-hmm. then it's, I, I think it's, it's incumbent on those tech providers to meet their clients more than halfway because their clients, by no fault of their own, are not equipped to really take that and run with it. Mm-hmm. And, and I think there are varying degrees of that. Arco Murray has invested in an innovation team. They've expanded their IT team so that when we do have those, those enterprise efforts, uh, I think we are more equipped than average, um, but we still rely heavily on the education components, the support, and the communication of our customer success teams at those software companies to be a, uh, in a supplement to our team because we're never going to have that big department that is there solely for the purpose of making this software work. Um, and, and I think most of the industry is in that same boat, probably to a lesser degree on average than what, what Arco has done. So it, it's, it's unfortunate for those teams, but when we're advising our, our portfolio companies and when we're talking to new, uh, new software uh, opportunities, the thing that we really harp on is build out your sales team and build out your customer success team and make sure that they are aligned uh, and, and know what the hell they're doing. Uh, because that is going to be the most pivotal part is, is getting that initial sale and then seeing it through and not relying on your client to see it through. Really being there and being involved and being proactive in your follow-up and communication to make sure that the champions within the business have what they need to succeed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I more than agree on that. I think that there's this odd myth that seems to be very prevalent in construction. I think it exists elsewhere, other industries too. But then that when you bring on a new software, you should be able to pick it up instantly and, and yeah. be an expert on it. And that's not yeah. the case with any software. <laughs> Nobody uses all of the, the tools and the, the bells and whistles of any software, uh, right. especially in construction, you know, there's a, it's a big kind of implementation and learning curve that comes along with it. And if the, the provider yeah. is not kind of holding the hand and, and walking that path with the client, uh, I just don't see how they're set up for success in the long term. Yeah. And if it were done the same way every time, then it would be different. But the, the complexity and the variability of our work is so massive that even for the simplest solution, you have to be really diligent about paying attention to the implementation of that solution mm-hmm. and identifying the outliers and attacking them aggressively and saying, I see it, I identify it, and we're going to come back to you with a solution or an alternative in, in short order. Mm-hmm. Because the thing that we don't have is time. Uh, and, and a lot of uh, the patience of the industry, I think, has been spent uh, in the last kind of 10 to 15 years of having subpar technology solutions for the problems that we're facing. So it's, and and none of this is fair to the like new entrepreneur that's coming in trying to solve a problem, right? But it is a reality of of the situation. Sure. Most of the time for most of our problems, even if it's something as simple as, I mean, I think about lien waivers on on our, uh, on our jobs where Mm -hmm. we have a payment application to an owner and um, we're trying to collect lien waivers from all the subcontractors and sub-tier contractors uh, on that job in order to release funds. That sa- it actually sounds simple when you kind of go through the steps, but it becomes infinitely more complex as soon as you get to one subcontractor that like doesn't use computers regularly. <laughs> you know, they're like bringing in their invoices handwritten and setting it on the superintendent's desk. Like yeah. all of a sudden your, your brilliant technology solution that has like automated this whole process falls apart because right. you've got someone that has a flip phone that's walking in with a handwritten invoice. So there's just, there's, there's a lot of uh, complexity and, and variability. Like I said, that I think those solution providers have to be on top of, and they have to pay attention to, and not just say, 
well, this is the way the system works, which I've got, I, I've gotten that response at times and, and to take an exception to it because I think that it is one thing to try to use the software incorrectly, but it's another thing to identify a use case uh, that is not fulfilled by the software that isn't a feature. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's those things that really, um, that, that I think trip up a lot of software startups or a lot of software implementations uh, that we could both, both sides could get better at. Um, and, and I, I try to push our, our software providers to really pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. Do you find certain things more effective in, in winning over those people that may be more hesitant or have been burned in the past to really embrace technology? Uh, yeah, I think one very effective thing is shutting my mouth and listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and listening a lot, like really not coming to the table with an agenda of, I have this thing to sell you, yeah. um, really coming to the table to learn and listen. And, and, uh, I, I, I think that that has, that has an effect of one educating myself, uh, and my team on the real core nuanced problem. And two, gaining credibility in, in the organization with all of the associates that I'm sitting and listening to, that I actually care what they're saying. And, and I won't bring something to them that has not taken the things they've told me into consideration. Yeah, no, I think that's great. The, the, uh, all, all too often, the person who, who speaks first kind of loses in that situation because you, you don't know what you don't know. And so I, I think going on that kind of listening tour is that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's helped us. And there, I mean, I think communication, accountability, objectives with key results, like all of those things, making, making your work measurable and, and being able to communicate that concisely back. Uh, those are all important, but I think it starts with the, the listening and understanding of, of the core problems. Yeah. So I, I think you have a, a unique perspective in your role with interacting with the, the startups and then developing custom tools in-house while also leveraging existing technology as well. Uh, how do you strategically know when it's better to invest in a new software or build it internally? Sure. That's a great question. And, and I think um, often that process starts with quantifying the problem as much as we can. So if we are talking with a team that comes to us with, with a, a pain that they're feeling that says, we just cannot do this any faster. Uh, here are the steps. Here are the people involved. Is there a better way to do this? And what we usually try to do in response is say, great, can you put minutes and hours behind those steps and, mm -hmm. and give us a, you know, an FTE equivalent of those people that are involved? And we're going to use that as our baseline to pursue a solution to this problem. And we've done this a handful of times where the ROI on investing in an existing enterprise solution is actually not great, greater than the time it would take us to build a simple solution to the core problem we're facing. So um, labor management, for example, we're, we subcontract a lot of our work where the, the primary um, staff that we're assigning to a job is a superintendent, a project manager, and a project assistant. Mm -hmm. And we were looking for ways to handle how we kind of uh, assign resources to our work. And we, ex we, we identified the problem, we quantified it internally, and we went to all the solution providers and heard their pitch and, and kind of told them what we were looking for. And they came back to us with proposals and after we had gone through the process of evaluating all those proposals, we looked at it and we said, how long would it take us to build what we really need? Three months. How much would that cost us internally? X amount. How much is that relative to these enterprise contracts that all of these solution providers are offering to us? Mm. Much more. <laughs> so let's build this solution internally. And if it doesn't work, then that is, that is money invested to better understanding the problem that we then leverage in those conversations with the enterprise solution providers. And what, what's happened in most of those, uh, those efforts where we do decide the solution uh, built internally is better, oftentimes that's, that's the thing that, that wins out. And, and, and we build everything with integrations in mind, so it's never something that's built in a silo 
uh, that can't be accessed by other systems. It's something that's built on an API that can move information to those, those core enterprise systems that we do buy into. Mm -hmm. So we don't necessarily have our resource management sitting in a silo over here that doesn't communicate with Procore, doesn't communicate with our ERP or Salesforce. It's tied into all of those. So as decisions are made in that tool that we've built internally, that information is being disseminated everywhere else. So it, it's, it's really a matter of quantifying that problem first then identifying the, the options and, and really trying to quantify the, the cost and return on those options and then executing. Mm -hmm. I love that you guys have the awareness too, not to build it in a silo and keep the, uh, keep it open to connecting with other, uh, software providers, but also just other tools and just perspectives and, and having that, that flexibility. That's huge. Yeah. It has been, uh, that has been my, uh, the, the drum that I have been beating for three years is uh, APIs everywhere. Like make sure that you know how to integrate with the system, how to get data from a system and, and let's stop duplicating and triplicating information. Let's pick a source as a source of truth and use that, leverage it for every other system so that when someone enters the source, the source information into that source of truth, it's disseminated everywhere else. And, and that, that has really taken, um, we, we have seen a lot of momentum gained in the last probably six to eight months in that regard, mm -hmm. where we did, we implemented Procore, we um, streamlined our, our salesforce.com implementation, and we really hammered home the information that lives in our ERP that is, that is the source of truth. And we're now kind of building those workflows that manage that data flow. So when data changes somewhere, it pushes to kind of that hub that traffics the information and says, mm -hmm. okay, this is coming from one source. Uh, and I understand that to be the source of truth. So I just disseminate, or this is actually coming from an, uh, a system that is not the source of truth. So I have business logic built in, in this hub that or we, not me specifically, but uh, I, uh, as, as Arco, yeah. uh, have business logic built into this hub that can push to human intervention if needed, or, or kind of uh, identify the logic that says what wins out when, uh, and really make that an easier process for everyone. So they, they don't have to think as much about, if I enter this here, I have to enter it in four other places to make sure that everyone that needs to know this information has it at the right time. Right. No, that's awesome. Uh, so if you could snap your fingers and innovate one thing in the industry, what would you do? Uh, I would create more open APIs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty, pretty easy answer, actually. <laughs> I think we sh our industry struggles with that. Um, that's usually my first question, my first technical question for a startup. Uh, is, is, do I have API access? Oh. Um, and the answer is, is kind of uh, middling between, yes, we have an open API um, and no, that's, that's on the roadmap, but it's not available. Yeah. So I would, I would open that up. Uh, I think that would be a major differentiator to our industry. And I think it would attract a lot of talent that would, uh, would see that as a major opportunity. Yeah. Nice. Well, how do people find out more information and, and connect with you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I am on Twitter, but I do not actively participate in Twitter. Uh, so you can find me there. Um, but I'm usually just liking other people's things. Uh, and uh, I am, I am available, uh, through email and, and, uh, um, yeah, through email and LinkedIn for all of my, my professional things. Uh, you, it's probably best to start with LinkedIn. Sounds good. Uh, last question for you. What does innovation mean to you? What does innovation mean to me? Innovation to me uh, is a collective effort to constantly iterate on processes to make them better. Yeah. Nice. I like it. Eric, thanks so much for taking the time and enjoying the show. Enjoy the conversation. Yeah, me too. Thanks a lot, Todd. This is this has been great. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come on.